Welcome to another video crystal ball from the University of Virginia Center for Politics. Now that Mitt Romney has all but wrapped up the Republican nomination, we're moving on to Veep Watch. You know, if John Nance Garner were alive today, we feel certain that he'd recognize the modern vice presidency is worth a lot more than a pitcher of warm spit, or whatever word he used. Uh, we're going to discuss some of our picks for Mitt Romney's vice presidential uh, nominee uh, in this edition of the Video Crystal Ball. And to start out with, uh, we undertook a comprehensive search of all the Republican candidates and uh, incumbents in the U.S. Senate, uh, Republican governors, other statewide Republican elected officials, even Republican celebrities and Hollywood personalities. We were trying to look for the ideal vice presidential candidate and we found him a surprising choice. He's a Washington outsider. He's beloved by conservatives. He's very telegenic, so important in this age. He's already famous. He's young and vigorous, and he's from a swing state and clearly is a heavyweight. The ideal vice presidential nominee for Mitt Romney is none other than Tim Tebow. There's just one problem. He's constitutionally ineligible because he's too young. Well, now that we've had our fun, let's get serious. Uh, we have divided the vice presidential candidates that we think are at least reasonable to consider into four tiers. And let's look at the first tier. We have four in the first tier. Uh, I think it will be a surprise to some people that we rank Ohio U.S. Senator Rob Portman as number one. He is the safest of the safe choices. He is fully qualified to be president. I don't think anyone could dispute that. He has rich experience uh, in government and is widely regarded uh, as having that expertise. Now, uh, he's as dry as a glass full of sand. He would fade into the background. He would cause Mitt Romney no problems. He fulfills that Hippocratic oath, first do no harm. By contrast, you have an exciting choice that we have as number two on our list, and that, of course, is Senator Marco Rubio from Florida. He opens the possibility, just the possibility, that Romney can appeal more fully to Hispanic voters, understanding that a Cuban American won't necessarily be attractive to those uh, of other nationalities. Uh, Senator Rubio also brings to the forefront the possibility that Romney can win the critical state of Florida with its 29 electoral votes. It's almost impossible to imagine Romney winning in November without winning Florida. Uh, rounding out our first tier, uh, we have uh, Governor Bobby Jindal of Louisiana, who at a very young age has got to be one of the most experienced public officials in America, running a university system, a state health system, having been in Congress and now in his second term already as governor of Louisiana. Uh, giving a bad State of the Union address is not enough to strike him from our first tier uh, because remember, uh, vice presidential nominees mainly are seen off the shoulder, behind the shoulder of the presidential candidate. Uh, he would add diversity to the ticket and experience too. And then finally, Paul Ryan of Wisconsin. We have some doubts because he's never run statewide in Wisconsin, uh, but this would bring a campaign focus to the budget and debt issues that should be a big part of a Republican campaign for the presidency. Now our second tier of the Romney Veep contenders. And we start, of course, with the giant personality of Chris Christie, governor of New Jersey. Uh, and there's no question that uh, he brings a lot to the table. Uh, of course, he also brings a certain level of controversy, and his major problem would be that he would be on the front page of the newspapers far more frequently uh, than Mitt Romney probably would be. Uh, that is not necessarily a good thing uh, for a vice presidential nominee, but clearly he'd have a lot of energy, a lot of juice uh, with the Tea Party, uh, with other conservatives, uh, though he has a fairly moderate record as governor of New Jersey. Uh, Jeb Bush uh, is certainly on this list. It's 
It's unlikely he'll end up being the nominee, but it's possible. He just has the wrong last name. Everything else in his resume fits Romney's needs. Uh, former Governor Tim Pawlenty uh, of uh, Minnesota, who of course uh, ran unsuccessfully for the nomination ever so briefly, but endorsed Romney and has been uh, the kind of choice that would also tend to uh, enhance Romney's credentials without overshadowing Romney. Governor Bob McDonnell of Virginia, who has been the most open about his ambitions to be vice president, uh, he is clearly available for the job and would accept in less than a nanosecond if offered. Uh, Governor Mitch Daniels of Indiana is on the list, well qualified. We wonder whether he'd accept even if it were offered. Uh, and Governor Mike Huckabee, former Governor Huckabee, is even better known than when he ran for president the first time, and he would help Romney with evangelicals. We have so much more detail about these candidates coming uh, in the crystal ball, and you can see all of their advantages and disadvantages uh, when the crystal ball comes out. Here's our third tier of Romney's Veep contenders, starting with New Hampshire Senator Kelly Ayotte, uh, Governor Brian Sandoval of Nevada, Governor Susanna Martinez of New Mexico, Senator Bob Corker of Tennessee, and former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. Uh, we don't believe that, that any of these are likely to be the nominee, but they're fallback candidates, and they're likely to be considered at least by the Romney team for reasons that we'll discuss in the crystal ball. By the way, we get lots of emails from people about Condi Rice, and they have wonderful justifications and argumentation as to why she should be picked for VP. Uh, we put her in the third tier because we just don't think she's interested at all. Uh, now, you never know, maybe if Romney is very persuasive and he thinks that Condi Rice uh, can help him on the ticket, uh, maybe he can persuade her uh, to join the ticket, but uh, that will surprise us if it happens. We have a number of other possibilities that we've included on the fourth tier of Romney beat possibilities. Uh, we're not convinced at all that any of these people will even be seriously considered, much less picked. But you never know in this process. Just think through the people who have been picked in both parties as vice presidential nominees. It's, it's really quite remarkable, the good choices and bad choices. So you just never know. On this list, Senator Pat Toomey from Pennsylvania, Senator John Thune from South Dakota, Senator Rand Paul from Kentucky, Governor Luis Fortuno from Puerto Rico, uh, Representative Kathy McMorris Rogers from Washington State, Senator Richard Burr from North Carolina, uh, David Petraeus, the new head of the CIA, former Congressman J.C. Watts of Oklahoma, and we're back to our old friend Tim Tebow. Now we always welcome Twitter questions and we try to answer a few in our video crystal ball. The first question for today comes from D. Kelly, 1916. Am I wrong to assume that Santorum is the most logical choice for vice president, given all those closest to the Tea Party have declined? Well, uh, you are wrong to assume that Santorum is the most logical choice. I think it's extremely unlikely he will be the vice presidential nominee, acknowledging that weird things happen in the process. But think back over the criticisms he's made of Mitt Romney. Uh, Rick Santorum has created the Democratic TV advertising program for the fall if he's on the ticket. It would end up being Romney versus Santorum rather than Romney versus Obama. I don't think that's a risk the Romney people want to take, and I doubt Santorum can deliver even Pennsylvania to Romney. A lot's changed since George H.W. Bush was picked by Ronald Reagan, even after he called Reagan's economic program Voodoo Economics. The second question comes from M.T. Gent, Montana Gent. Based on the premise that candidates do unexpectedly well in their home state, could Romney win Massachusetts and New Hampshire? Massachusetts, not a chance. Uh, he may reduce Obama's margin to the upper 50s, uh, but that's about it. New Hampshire, it's one of our seven great swing states. Here, Romney is much more competitive than any of the other Republicans could have been, and so we're going to be watching Romney in addition to the other key swing states in November. And now I'm going to turn it over to two terrific people, my colleagues on the crystal ball, for whom I am very grateful, 
Uh, first, uh, Jeff Skelly is going to talk about uh, a Senate question, and then uh, Kyle Condit from Independence, Ohio, is going to take uh, a House question. Now we have a Senate question from Twitter user Julie F75, and she asks, do you see the toss-up Senate races favoring Republicans or Democrats? Is the landscape still favorable for Republicans with the retirement of Olympia Snow? The landscape is probably still marginally favorable for Republicans. However, Olympia Snow's retirement has probably thrown that seat into the hands of independent former governor of Maine, Angus King, who we think would probably be most likely caucus with the Democrats. However, if you add up all of the lean, likely, and safe seats for each side, according to the crystal ball ratings we have, uh, you get a 46-46 tie in the Senate with eight toss-ups. So the situation is whoever can win the majority of those eight toss-ups will have a majority in the Senate. So we figure there's a good chance it could be 50-50 or more likely 51-49 in favor of either the Democrats or the Republicans. So it's going to be a very close race. And now I'm going to throw it over to my colleague, uh, Kyle Kondik, who will answer a question about the House. Our final question is from K Street. Uh, will 2012 be a congressional wave election in Democrats' favor? I believe so. What say you all? Uh, well, it's possible that the, uh, uh, Cong the House elections will be a uh, tidal wave. Of course, we saw tidal waves in 2006 and 2008 for the Democrats and one for the Republicans in 2010. That said, what that will require uh, almost certainly is for President Obama to do uh, as well or better than he did in 2008, and that was about 53 percent of the vote. Uh, a big Obama vote could sort of uh, be the tide that uh, raises up Democratic hopes in the House. Um, but uh, barring that, it seems unlikely that there will be a, a big tide in the House. Thanks a lot, Kyle, and thank all of you for watching the video, Crystal Ball. We'll see you next time.